So I've been asked uh, really to come and to talk to you guys about creative bravery. Um, and I've called this Question Bravely, Answer Boldly, which is uh, the mantra that we have at Mr. P and also my, I guess, personal mantra. Um, as creative individuals, uh, I really believe that we have sort of both the, the power and the responsibility to set a vision of the future, I guess, for other people to follow. That could be a creative vision, could be, a, you know, if you think about all the fantastic um, science fiction writers since day immemorial, you know, the way that they, they're talking and exploring what the future could be really helps us go in a direction and deliver on that. And there's a fantastic uh, poem about this. I'm just going to play you this little clip. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. So, um, God rest his soul. Um, he, uh, he is quoting this beautiful poem by an Irish poet called Arthur O'Shaughnessy. And this poem, We Are the Music Makers and We Are the Dreamers of the Dreams, is all about how creative people are the ones to take those first steps, I guess, into the future, are the ones to kind of set the vision of the future. And, you know, it comes down to this idea, you know, we really have this power to, to shape where we're going to go. And that's really exciting. Um, and the way that we do that is through making, not just doing, not just doing the same thing day after day after day, but actually making, creating new things, exploring. That real belief in the transformative power of creativity, of everything that, that is the best that humanity has to offer, um, and of always choosing interesting. And so my talk today, I guess, is showing you the way that I pr approach creativity in my own work and how I apply these kinds of things to my own work. So. I just wanted to give these guys uh, a little mention because I think these guys really epitomize what I mean by sort of building the future or creating the future or doing something, uh, doing something interesting. So Copenhagen Suborbitals, I went to visit them recently in Copenhagen. They're uh, Europe's first amateur space program and they are building a manned rocket to send into space uh, basically on their weekends in this shed. Uh, they've written all of the, the software to, to allow it to, uh, to get up into the air. They've built everything from scratch. Like every, it's incredible, like welding workshop. And I just think it just, it's so exciting. It really does embody that, that spirit of creative bravery. And that kind of spirit of doing something and trying, trying things is why I founded She Says 10 years ago. And if Kerry Finch is in the room, and if you are a woman and you would like to get involved in She Says, we actually have a She Says in Amsterdam. Um, it's why I founded Can't Festivals. A Can't Festival is a festival for people who can't go to Cannes. And uh, the reason that uh, I founded Can't was because I really felt that there were so many people who are so important to the work that wins in Cannes who never get to go. Number one, developers, producers, designers, and also like the young, amazing creative minds who are part of building these pieces of work. So this, only, this runs in London over the course of the week of Cannes, and it brings a bit of the spirit of Cannes to London. Um, it's why I was also a co-founder of the Great British Diversity Experiment, which happened this year. Uh, it was the first large-scale practical uh, experiment in how diversity works and why it works and why diverse teams make better work. It's why I'm a member of Papel and Caneta, which is an amazing organization set up by a 28-year-old in Brazil, and he gets uh, incredible creative people from all around the world to give their time for free to work on projects together for social good. And lastly, it's uh, why I also founded Mr. President, because I really believe that in this age, I don't know how many of you guys work in advertising, how many in coding, how many in design, but I think we're at a stage where a lot of, particularly the digital side of marketing and advertising, has become really, really fucking boring. Um, and that great spirit of entrepreneurship and adventure that we used to have has, uh, has started to disappear. So we founded Mr. President really to try to bring that spirit back. So how do we do it at Mr. President? Well, we want a future. I want a future where creativity has broken its borders. So, you know, you're no longer just answering a marketing brief. Maybe your creativity is intrinsic, and if, if you're working in tech development and you're building platforms, you're already doing this, but intrinsic in actually making really useful services or businesses or, you know, putting your creativity to a broader good. 
And this is... So that is a piece of work, uh, Virgin Red, that we've built from scratch. So we've done everything from the branding, the logo, we've done some really beautiful identity work. So we've done everything, we've built a really dynamic, um, thank you, really dynamic iconography system that works across all of the different Virgin brands. I don't know how many people know how Virgin works, but uh, very little is actually owned by Richard Branson. Most of the Virgin Empire is owned by other businesses, and he just has a small percentage. And what Virgin Red is, it's the first new Virgin brand for a very long time, and it sits in the center with Richard, and at its heart, it's a loyalty scheme. But it's a loyalty scheme which is incredibly difficult to execute because you have uh, like a back-end on Virgin Atlantic, and then you have another different back-end on Virgin Trains, and you have people that are Virgin Media subscribers in the UK or go to a Virgin Gym. They all work on different systems and platforms, and the businesses aren't connected. And so we needed to develop a loyalty scheme, an app-based loyalty scheme, that rewarded people even before we could get the tech working in the background, which we're gradually starting to plug in all these other businesses. Um, and so the whole uh, concept around this is uh, when you live a life more virgin, you know, when you're playing, when you're having a, a, a good time, when you're exploratory, uh, when you're being an adventurer, things get better. And so the app itself is built, it's, uh, it's gamified, basically the more you play with the app, the more rewards you get. This is only launched in the UK at the moment, uh, but after uh, a, a public beta for about six months, um, we did this. Richard has hidden a chest of treasure somewhere on Necker Island. And to help you find it, he's leaving a trail of gold coins across the UK and the Virgin Empire. They could be hidden here, here, even here. You just need to keep your eyes open and find them. And when you do, you need to snap them through the Virgin Red app. The more coins you find, the more vaults you unlock. And when you've found one, We'll help you find more. And the more vaults you unlock, the closer you'll get to Necker Island. Let the hunt begin. Download the app now. So our thought was that like a, a really sort of interesting product like this needed to have a really interesting virgin way of launching it. So we did this uh, uh, treasure hunt all around the UK. It was a bit like Pokemon Go, uh, about a month before Pokemon Go. <laughs> launched and without, uh, without the, the actual AR. Um, but basically, you were, allowed, you were able to travel all the way around the UK. There were digital coins on properties. There were physical coins. I've got a picture here of the physical coins. Um, so this is a photograph of the actual gold-plated coins with Richard Branson's head on, which he loved. Uh, so they were, <laughs> they were hidden in different coffee cups all around, the, all around the UK. We were able to use all of the other Virgin Brands media to be able to put these codes and put these coins uh, across uh, in the physical and in the digital world all around the UK. And uh, the winners just two weeks ago went to Necker Island to dig treasure with uh, Richard Branson. Uh, but this, you know, this for us is really, really exciting. It's sort of delivering on something that hadn't even been uh, conceived of yet and building the whole thing from beginning to end from scratch. Um, I'm really excited about this idea where we scare ourselves every day and kind of lean into our fear. I don't think we necessarily challenge ourselves or put ourselves in uncomfortable positions enough. Uh, it's very, very easy just to keep doing the same thing every day. Um, but when you really start to kind of play and when you really start, to, I guess, to be a little bit brave, beautiful things can happen. So this is a piece of work uh, we did for Bacardi. Um, Bacardi almost two years ago now, threw an enormous fuck-off party in the Bermuda Triangle in, at Halloween with Kendrick Lamar, Calvin Harris and Ellie Goulding headlining. It was this huge festival, three-day festival. It was for 2,000 people. And those 2,000 people were like influencers. So they were the, you know, the kind of coolest. Vice had a private plane flying from LA and what have you. 
And the job that we were given was to use those influencers to create you know, as much noise as possible. Now, we really believed, and this is part of, I guess, this is the, the bravery and the idea and the bravery from the client, that uh, just like showing pictures of people, like cool people on a beach, to guys who are in Midwest America who will never be that cool is not particularly inspiring. It's just like, it's not, it's not very nice. It's something they see all the time. It's like, I'm just not cool enough to go to that awesome party. Um, and so we wanted to do something from uh, that audience's point of view and really understand that audience. And so we found a really amazing guy called Marcus Haney. He's um, a filmmaker, but he's also uh, quite a famous festival crasher uh, in the States, and we got him to break into the festival. Now, we didn't know how he was going to do it. He didn't know, we didn't know whether he was going to do it, and he had to do it for real, so there was only one client that knew that this was happening. All the other clients thought that we were just going to be filming people on a beach. Uh, and it was absolutely terrifying, but this is... Uh, what happened? really exciting you know we thought we would be when we got the brief delivering some social assets and what we delivered was a, a made for MTV a half hour documentary made by this guy it's the most amazing road movie he has like he takes all his friends one of his friends is in a wheelchair they that like, carry their friend in the wheelchair over the back of the island to get in obviously they dress up as uh, he dresses up as Ellie Goulding his mate dresses up as Ellie Goulding's boyfriend they get in backstage, they surprise her just before she goes on stage. We, none of this we knew was going to happen um, until we got delivered the footage. And then actually, uh, uh, it was kind of so brave and so challenging for Bacardi that uh, Marcus and Mr. President actually owned the rights to that film. It was kind of the most successful bit of advertising they never made uh, because they can't talk about ever having made it. Um, but that was really, yeah, really good fun. But, you know, leaning into your fear and doing something because you believe in it, uh, even if you're not sure whether it's going to work. Uh, the next one is about breathing and allowing room for experimentation. So um, I was very lucky to meet this guy, Damien, from OK Go last year, um, just as a fluke. But we spoke a lot about the creative process. And he said to me, like, I don't understand your industry. I don't understand how you can get the best creative work if you plan everything right until the end, all the way up front. So you don't leave any room for like, happy accidents. You know, why have you done this whole storyboard and then you hire a really expensive studio and really expensive stuff and have to do it really, really quickly and do it just like you thought you were going to do it? He so said all the magic for them comes in actually the making and the playing. So the way that they work is they get a cheap space for a month, and then they go in there and they play and they try things out and what have you, and that's how they get their incredible work. And if you've seen their piece of work for Honda, it's a five and a half minute ad for Honda. It's the most like, beautiful, um, it's incredible piece of work uh, done by a guy called Mori in Japan. Um, you know, I thought, you know, he, had, he has a point there. And actually, where you find sometimes your best work is through experimentation and through play. So this is a piece of work for Mai. It's a mustard brand. It's almost 300 years old. Um, 
they have mustard batiks, which I didn't know were a thing. Uh, but they are basically stores with 40, 45 different flavors of mustard, uh, all of these oils, all of this cornichon. You go in, it's like a beautiful perfumery, and it's in a very expensive part of London, a very expensive part in Paris and in New York. Um, in the first year that they opened, they collected 60 email addresses <laughs> from the people in the store. So people were going, spending 60, 70 pounds on mustard, and not leaving their details in order to be kind of followed up with later, or spoken to about the brand, or spoken to about maybe different recipes, or all the things they wanted to do. What we realized, so the brief came in, do we need an iPad? Because they were just filling them in on cards. When we went in there, we said, no, the, the value exchange is not right. And so we sat in the store and we observed people, IDO style, for quite a long time. And we realized, actually, that the problem that the customers were having uh, is that you can't possibly taste 43 different or 45 different flavors of mustard. Uh, you can't get through them all. And even if you do, you can't remember the ones that you just tasted. And actually, there is a, an issue that needs to be solved in the store. And if we can solve that in the store and connect that to ECRM, that's our way forward. So we spent the next 12 months really experimenting and playing and trying things out and working with the woodfitters in the store and uh, every little tiny detail to make what's well, actually a really beautiful um, digital layer. Two hundred people visit the beautiful My Boutique every day. That's over 70,000 customers each year falling in love with the world of My and their vast array of mustards. The problem is, most only visit once. Mai wanted to convert these one-off shoppers in-store into regular buyers online, introducing Le Maison Mai Discovery Spoons, a set of clever tasting spoons with hidden RFID technology that help consumers navigate the 45 different mustards in-store and enhance the tasting experience. By simply tapping the mustards they like, the spoons save customers' favorite flavors for later, so when they've finished exploring, they can review their selection, send their favourites home and take a physical reminder of the experience away with them. Capturing their mustard preferences, my now have a reason to speak to customers again that seamlessly connects the beautiful real-world shopping experience with the online shopping experience. Since the Discovery Spoons launched, people shopping in the boutique are spending 8% more in store and Le Maison Maya Discovery Spoons are now making their voyage to Paris and New York. Très bien. Yeah, so that piece of work, thank you, that piece of work would never have happened without that like, real desire for experimentation and for play. And the thing that I'm most proud of, actually, you know, um, for those of you who uh, are kind of versed in behavioral economics, which I assume a lot of you guys are, choice paralysis is real. And by basically creating a shortlist for people using this spoon, the sales in the stores just went up dramatically um, and have stayed up. So that's really great, you know, to actually make something as well that is not a PR stunt, but actually a proper piece of uh, equipment that sits in that store and adds value to the brand. Um, and then, you know, I really think this, uh, you know, creative bravery is about trying to keep that magic and play part of every, everything that we do every day. It's really, really easy to lose that feeling of joy and that feeling of play and actually, that feeling of play is where a lot of great ideas come from. So um, this is a piece of work uh, I did for Dewars. Um, the brief, again, uh, was for doing some kind of bottleneck for their whiskey to stick in a supermarket, um, to tell people about the history of the brand, the provenant. Um, and again, uh, our real belief is that this is, this is a kind of a starting whiskey. This is for young guys and girls, but mostly guys. Uh, it's not drunk on its own, you're not sitting there like sipping it. Uh, you are taking it to a party to share with your friends. And we thought that it's kind of almost pointless to have something on there which is very functional, telling me about the history of the brand, if I'm going to be drinking this at a party. What you want at a party is you want some, something to like, show off to your mates. Uh, and so that was the premise of this idea, that's where this idea came from. And then again, we just played and played and played and found I guess the most fun way we could think of, of telling that story in a way that didn't feel like it was uh, telling the story at all. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Can I have a 
tell you about what happened to me in 1900. <laughs> First, that couple of seconds of fun, it still works, it's on, online, you don't need an app. Um, uh, but that first moment of anywhere you are in the world, you'll be transported. We got to plan the, all the routes from all these sort of different places in the world, all the way through, you go through Paris, you go through all the features of London, you go up to Glasgow through the bottling plant to the distillery, where you see the weather uh, on the day it was bottled and other live information about that day. Uh, but a really exciting piece of work but something we wouldn't have got to without, I guess, being sort of brave in, in terms of kind of playing, and again, it, that idea of experimentation. And then very, very lastly, because I've only got a few minutes left, this doesn't have a video, but I think the most important thing um, about sort of being brave and being creative is actually these things here. So I think when we think about being a great creative, we think about having really great ideas, but actually great ideas are the easy bits, the really, really difficult bits, is to really have proper empathy with your audience, uh, to not be stereotyping people in your work, not for the sake of anything, uh, and to have as diverse a team as possible to get you to really, really interesting ideas. And I think that in itself is a really brave approach to creativity and one that the industry as a whole really, really struggles with. Um, you know, is a big challenge for all of us, but it's incredible to walk into agency after agency and see the same systems in place, the same kinds of faces, the same coming from the same schools, uh, and that, that, that lack of experimentation in terms of your team and in terms of how you treat the people that you speak to. And I guess I'll just wrap that up by saying, don't be a dick. Uh, if there was one thing that I could say to all of you about creative bravery, like one thing to just remember, and yes, that is me with a dick. Um, it's just, yeah, just don't, don't be a dick about things. Have that real empathy and have that warmth and have that... Try to have that understanding with who you're talking to and you'll make great, brave, creative work. Um, thank you. <laughs>